Welcome everybody. Um, I'm from Brisbane and we have people here from all around New Zealand and Australia and I believe it's only New Zealand, Australia. We did invite some people from Asia Pacific uh, Unitarian Group, the wider group, uh, Tet Galado in Philippines. She may join. Um, so I'm part of the Australian uh, New Zealand Unitarian Universalist Association, ANZOA, on the committee and as Clay is, and Clay is the president. And this group has been uh, group meeting for many years uh, in a regular way. And every couple of years we've been meeting face to face, but this year we, just, we were scheduled to have a face to face gathering somewhere. And of course with COVID that's been forced to take a backflip. And so we're using the, you know, the knowledge and technology that's now available to create closer bonds with our greater UU community. A warm welcome to everybody, especially those from New Zealand and Southern Australia, where it's pretty cool at the moment. In Brisbane, we traditionally acknowledge the indigenous ancestors of the land and their communities as holders of memories and culture and spiritual well-being of their culture. And they have a sense of gratitude to the land that sustained them over many, many generations that we rarely see in modern society. And we all have ancestors stretching back to the dawn of human life. And we are alive because they and their communities survived very hard times and challenges, whether by accident or by skill, they sustained each other physically and mentally. And we are here because of their tenacity. And so we want to be part of a continuing community of good ancestors to support one another and nourish our spirits, even as the land nourished our ancestors and yours and everyone else's in this group. So may this time together be a time of nourishment for our mind and body and spirits and for our heart's ease as the land was for them. And so it is with great pleasure that I now hand over to Clay Nelson from Auckland and Clay is the president of the Anzua Universalist, Unitarian Universalist Association. So I'll just pass over to Clay. Thanks. Thank you, James. I think it would be appropriate to have a moment to center ourselves in silence. We usually do it with the ringing of a bell. I will. Uh, I don't have the bell. Uh, I have a wine glass. <laughs> I'm going to uh, do that. And during the moment of silence, I ask you to remember that 23,355,139 people reported today who have been infected by COVID-19 and that 807,619 who have died. This morning, I'd like to welcome you to an experiment made necessary by the pandemic. So it requires some out of box thinking by your executive committee. The Australian New Zealand Unitarian Universalist Association, or affectionately known as ANZUA's primary reason for existence is to provide a, a means of connection 
and support for Unitarians up and down New Zealand and across Australia. As a global faith movement, there aren't a lot of new views, but that's particularly true in Australasia. As a result, we risk isolation in our effort to make our presence felt over an awful lot of geography. Anzua seeks to mitigate feelings of being alone and our efforts to embody the seven principles that define our purpose. We try to meet this need for connection with our magazine Quest, faithfully edited by Michael McPhee, a website and a biennial conference. Last year, in blissful ignorance of what 2020 would bring, we agreed that we needed to meet annually. So much for best laid plans. This service is our plan B. Plan B has one important advantage. Instead of only a few representatives from each congregation and fellowship attending, every Unitarian Universalist is able to attend without the expense of traveling great distances. So as your president, and on behalf of the executive committee, we welcome you to this annual gathering of Anza. It's going to be kind of a combination worship and workshop experience. So we will begin our worship portion together, willing to be authentic with each other, honest within ourselves, and open to connection in all its forms. And now I would like to invite Connie Gibbons from First UU Fellowship in Melbourne to do our virtual chalice lighting. If you have a chalice or candle, this would be a time to light it. Uh, Thank you, Clay. Spirit of life and love, we gather today as a community of faith and hope. Today, we are distant yet joined, joined by our, our shared tradition and our commitment to compassion. May this warm light inspire us to fill our lives with the Unitarian Universalist ideals of acceptance, justice, and love. Thank you, Connie. Now, I'd like to invite Peter Eberhardt of the Melbourne, Melbourne, sorry about that, Melbourne <laughs> Unitarian Peace Memorial Church to uh, give us a reading for today. Thank you very much, Clay. Uh, the reading chosen this morning is from the Reverend David Boomba. He was then head of the Meadville Lombard Theological School in Chicago, Illinois. And it's an extract from a, an address or a sermon that he gave called What We Believe. We believe that the moral impulse that weaves its way through our lives leads us to practices of justice, mercy and compassion and is a universal longing that finds outlet in our best moments. We believe that our location within the community of living things places upon us inescapable responsibilities. Life is more than our understanding of it, but the level of our comprehension demands that we act out of conscious concern for the broadest vision of community that we can command. And we seek not our welfare alone, but the welfare of the whole. We believe that we are part of the interdependent web of existence that compels us to protect the environment that nurtures all living things. We believe that functions that divide us from each other and from the community is to be resisted in the name of that larger vision of a world free of exploitation, inequality and man's inhumanity to man. In many ways, it has been dreams that have shaped our past and hopefully our destiny. But dreaming a great dream is meaningless unless we act upon that dream. 
dreams of the human are to the human community what genes are to the individual body. Dreams define the limits of the possible. Dreams describe the inherent potential within any community. Without dreams, there can be no cultural evolution, no better society. Without dreams, we are lim limited to what has been. Without a vision, in the words of the Hebrew scriptures, the people perish. We are, by our nature, a community of dreamers, of people who see the world as it is, who understand the great distance between what is and what, what might be, and refuse to be satisfied with that discrepancy. We speak for unrealised possibilities and challenge the complacency of the status quo. But dreams are not enough. We must have the courage to take risks on behalf of those dreams. Dreamers have to believe that the dream is worth taking risks, worth supporting. Dreamers have to believe that they exist in a culture in which their efforts together do not diminish their resources, but multiply them, making possible results which could not have been predicted at the outset. What are we without our dreams of a better world and our determination to see these dreams come to fruition? But there is this thing about dreams. Dreams beget dreams. Even as they are translated into reality, they are replaced by new dreams. Our Unitarian Universalism and the broader community we serve are the generators of the dreams, the keepers of the dreams, the servers of the dreams. He concludes by saying, we are called upon to dream again as others have dreamed before us, to shape a society which nurtures the human spirit, which speaks out to a world about the challenges which confront our society, which seeks to make a profound difference in the world we share in common. Like our dreams, the dawning future will not come of itself, or to use the words of the American Unitarian hymn, a world made free and all her people one. Reverend David Bumba. Thank you, Clay. Thank you, Peter. As we planned this service, it wasn't hard to come up with what we wanted the theme to be, connection and disconnection. The title of my talk is Connection and Disconnection, the story of our lives. From the moment of our birth, we are introduced to the distress of disconnection and the comfort of connection. We may not remember the cutting of the cord and the first time we were held to breast, but they were momentous. If our lives were a symphony, these were the overture. The motif of disconnection and con connection has been embedded in who we are and repeated over and over again, albeit with many variations ever since. The world pandemic is one such variation. It is as universal as the birth experience. No one is untouched by it. The motif could not be more strident or discordant. I can't think of another time in history when this was so true. Not even 9-11 or 12-9 as we experienced it down under compares. The, the disconnection has nearly drowned out connection. Even as we share the experience of fear, anxiety, loneliness, and uncertainty. Ironic, isn't it? It is an existential crisis. A multitude of studies have shown conclusively that human connection is essential in maintaining our overall emotional, spiritual, and physical health. What exactly? is human connection. 
Human connection is an energy exchange between people who are paying attention to one another. It has the power to deepen the moment, inspire change, and build trust. It is a challenge to achieve from two meters apart with a mask covering our smile. How we long for a hug. Yet achieve it, we must, as it is the foundation of social connection. What is social connection? When researchers refer to the concept of so social connection, they mean the feeling that you belong to a group and generally feel close to other people. Scientific evidence strongly suggests that this is a core psychological need essential to feeling satisfied with your life. Data indicates that we can increase social connection through practicing compassion for others as well as for ourselves. Another way is contributing to our community, focusing on what we give, not on what we get or what others got. Lastly, and most importantly, connecting with yourself. We must know who we are and have confidence in ourselves if we desire to connect with others. If nothing else, COVID has made clear the truth but behind the universal, Unitarian Universalist seventh principle. Everything is a part of an interdependent web of existence, even a deadly virus. This speaks to the connection counterpoint of the motif. An important way we discover our connection is through our stories. What is the nature of our connection to the natural world, to the universe, to one another? What connections, webs of relationships do you notice? Which ones do you share with one another? We can tell our stories of connection and transformation in the natural world. Poet Annie Dillard describes a startling encounter with a weasel when they locked eyes for the longest moment, feeling as if they exchanged souls for that instant. Her writings are filled with perceptive descriptions of connection within nature and spirit. Albert Schweitzer tells of the church bells ringing right when he was aiming his slingshot at a songbird. That was the last time he thought of killing a bird. He later became a world-renowned humanitarian, living a life of medical service. Environmentalist Aldo Leopold tells him when he was young and part of the rampant wolf killing culture of shooting a wolf and looking the wolf in the eyes as he died. Never again. We can tell stories from our areas of expertise. Scientists can tell you how we share genes with other organisms. Would you believe that bananas are our distant cousins? They share 60% of our genes. Scientists tell about the genes in our bodies and, how, and about how our bodies are mostly not human because of the trillions of microorganisms we carry to keep us alive. They call it the microbiome. It is our personal support system. Physicists can try to explain that at the quantum level, a concept beyond our understanding, or at least mine, everything is entangled with everything else. It may be the last mystery of the universe to be unraveled. And then again, we may never understand it only experience it. 
We can tell stories from the milestones of our lives, times of mourning, times of celebration, times of achieving a dream, times of testing, times of inspiration, times of hope and despair. We can tell everyday stories, stories about our everyday lives. What did we have for dinner? Or what did we binge on Netflix after dinner? What our boss said today? We can reminisce about our ancestors, our favorite holiday, or first kiss. As you use, we can share our self-effacing jokes, what we like about our congregation or fellowship, why we keep coming back when identifying with a faith, faith movement is becoming an anachronism, how we felt when we, with our fellow UUs, stood up for social, racial, economic, and environmental justice, how we discovered this one-of-a-kind faith movement that has no creed in the first place, for 90% of us weren't born to. Each story will be unique. Let me share some of mine as an example. Mine is a journey of connection and disconnection. It began when a UU couple from All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington, D.C. surprised me with a generous grant to go to an Episcopal, think Anglican, Episcopal seminary. My next encounter was during my clinical training at a mental hospital. My co-chaplain was a UU. We, we hit it off and became good friends, frequently taking the piss about each other's theology. One of my favorite memories was his trying to preach on the Trinity to a room full of schizophrenic patients. They saw right through his discomfort. They were crazy, not dumb. After 16 years of putting up with homophobic and misogynistic conservatives holding the Episcopal Church hostage, I decided to move on. Problem was, I didn't know where. It was as much of a surprise as the grant I received when I found out. A 400 member UU church in Santa Barbara asked me to be their administrator. It felt like coming home. Four years later, I served a congregation of a similar size in Sacramento for another four years in the same capacity. It was there I was encouraged to take steps to be recognized as a UU minister, not just an Anglican priest. When that was nearly completed, George W. Bush got reelected and I decided to see more of the world. Sadly for me, I, I couldn't make a living in New Zealand as a UU minister. As an alternative, I fell in with the most progressive Anglican church in New Zealand. While there, I was discovered by some Auckland Unitarians and invited to preach periodically. After nine years of being infamous for my billboards, I retired as an Anglican priest, much to the bishop's relief. And three months later, began my tenure as a minister for the Auckland Unitarians. I was home again once more. And that was six years ago. In reflection on my journey, I have wondered why I was so drawn to our tradition when there was much I loved about my Anglican heritage. I think it goes back to the motif of connection and disconnection I've heard play repeatedly throughout my life. Some religions teach that suffering 
and injustice of the world are caused by sin. People lacking the right beliefs and the wrath of a punishing God. They, they conclude that people are in need of repentance and salvation. In our tradition, we see disconnection as the root of suffering and injustice in the world. People are often disconnected from their deepest selves, from one another, and from a sense of belonging to a greater whole. We see salvation as the experience of connection, here and now, in this life. Connection to great, greater depth, meaning, and purpose heals and gives life meaning and joy. When we recognize our profound interconnection with one another, we wake up to what we can do to contribute and serve needs greater than our own. Namaste. Blessed be. I would like to invite Bert Blackburn from Melbourne. Nice that you have a name that rhymes with your church. Melbourne, Unitarian Peace Memorial Church to extinguish the chalice. Thanks very much, Clay. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth. The warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Do we have, well, I think James has some, a notice. I don't know if others might. Yes, I have a notice. Um, well, I've got some promotional material. <laughs> Uh, for the last few months, well, maybe four or five months, um, the Unitarians in the Philippines and Singapore and Northeast India have been getting together um, once or twice a month and running a collaborative service. And that's been on Saturday afternoon on, and we're planning to run them regularly on the Saturday afternoon of the first Saturday of each month. And there are some you know, there are many Unitarians up in the Kazi Hills, up above Bangladesh. Some 10,000 Unitarians up there have been going since the early 1900s up in the very high country, um, living in a matrilineal society, one of the remaining matrilineal societies in the world. So they're a very interesting group. And, there's, you know, we often have a few people from there join. We have uh, people from Singapore, um, Philippines in Dumaguete from the Negros Island. Where else have we had? The Hong Kong. We had a couple stuck in um, Vietnam. Vietnam for a few weeks. They were, they were um, Czechoslovakia. Yeah, they were from Czechoslovakia. Unitarians in Czechoslovakia are stuck in Vietnam and joining us from their hotel room. So, And we often get other people across Australia, New Zealand, or a few people from New Zealand. But, um, you know, I just think maybe people don't hear about it. So if, if you'd like to join, talk to Clay or whoever you know and get my contacts and we'll put you on the list. There's a Facebook group for it and also a, um, a WhatsApp group for it. So, and that's a way of forming connection across different uh, Unitarian groups across our greater area. So. Oh. It's a chance to understand more about Unitarian and its expression in different countries. Our closing words are by Rex Hunt from the Spirit of Life Fellowship in Sydney. Rex and I go way back. Okay. We're both stirrers. <laughs> he was a retired uh, United Church minister, mm -hmm. United Church minister. Uh, who's found his way over to the Unitarians. Um, I'm a former Anglican who's found his way to the Unitarians. 
but we used to uh, be uh, in an organization called Common Dreams. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of you may have heard of it. Uh, it was about looking at progressive uh, religious theology and ideas. Anyway, Bert is somewhat of a bard. He is, writes beautifully, and I frequently used his material in the past, and he contributed this for our closing words. There is something deeply humanizing being in a garden, the earth warm under our feet. The rustle of eucalyptus leaves in a light spring wind overheard. And a bee flirting with buds on a yellow daisy bush. Biophilia, the love of nature and living things. In our gathering, may we be surprised by the wonder of each ordinary moment aware of how life thrives in a bewildering diversity and in our movements leaving the light in the wonderosity of what is yet to be moments full of life go in peace Namaste.